Um, I just uh, wanted to share with what we're doing in the Northern Health Authority and plus uh, in other areas of the province that are dealing with some of the dilemmas that we've heard already today uh, from continuing professional development, as uh, Doug's been talking about, and about primary care, getting data from primary care, um, making it meaningful and actually getting some actionable uh, activity. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, with, as with anything, it's really useful to know where we came from and how we got to where we are. And it was a revelation to me a little while back that this is a 2,000-year-old problem. <laughs> and that's probably why we're having so much trouble dealing with it. And that this is uh, Hippocrates uh, administering medication. And what is kind of, or something, <laughs> 2,000 years ago, God only knows what. This was just after they drilled the hole in the guy's head, probably. Um, but, but what it really represents is it's one patient at a time. It, the walk-in clinic, if you will, uh, if, um, of, of patient care. And it's also one provider at a time. The perspective of that expert, that person that somebody comes to for some trusted advice and help. Um, all very good, got us going. Um, but it's a paradigm that's probably going somewhat similar to this. As we start moving towards interdisciplinary care, even beyond multidisciplinary into interdisciplinary, to, to talk, to address the issues that it's not all about the doctor um, and so on. But to make history has also had some good things about some of the stuff that spun out of uh, the one patient and one provider at a time. And this notion of the, the, what we started writing, and I'm not actually sure when we started writing stuff down in the way that we do now, but this notion of a faithful record of what clinicians have heard, seen, thought, and done is excellent. Um, but the problem is, is that, of course, in paper, you can't actually analyze any of that. Um, and also, those... Uh, records are siloed, as, uh, just as our activity is siloed with home and community care, mental health and addictions, public health and so on and so forth, all operating in these silos. And as some have suggested with underground sewers that we can't see that tries to connect these, <laughs> these silos. So our current state is really one of trying to move that stuff um, that was barely legible and it's definitely not reportable uh, over into something like that. The problem is, of course, as many jurisdictions are discovering, that it's still just text. So now we have the electronic paper record, and actually we've also got electronic silos, uh, similarly with sewers underneath. <laughs> um, so, so as we're going down this journey, um, this PricewaterhouseCoopers um, Cooper, uh, study commissioned by Canada Health Infoway last year, very interesting, uh, the emerging benefits. So we're not even sure yet what we're going to get with all of this stuff. We have some great hopes. And the surprising thing from that study was that the benefits we're getting is more along the lines of efficiency, uh, and mostly efficiency for the clinicians, which is a big surprise to many clinicians who were pounding their fists many years ago saying, you know, compensate or legislate. It's the, it's the society that's going to get the benefit from these records, uh, not me, and so you have to pay me to help for my extra labors. Um, but the, you know, the interesting thing is, is that a lot of the stuff that's happening is actually benefiting the providers with decreased chart pulls, more easily organized uh, diagnostics, with some savings, of course, that we can prove to the system, but we have a ways to go. In the interest of those silos, we have built an awful lot of systems, and this is in our own health authority, just a small representation, actually, of the different connections that a clinician if they really want to get a good comprehensive picture of the patient, has to go to all of those different places with the viewer and then make some connection and maybe turn the chair around back into the, their own computer system and make some summaries and some documentations. And so, and even complicating that is that if you want to actually communicate and open up those silos, we don't have an electronic way yet to do it seamlessly and easily and definitely not one that can maintain the um, concepts, in uh, coded concepts and so on, going from one um, place to another. We're also um, not very good at doing what Doug has just showed us about how we can actually compare and look and analyze um, uh, in, uh, our work with others for both uh, uh, you know, professional practice satisfaction, the competitive nature of clinicians, uh, physicians or type A, uh, get them in a room to compare data, it's unbelievable to see what happens. <laughs> the, 
The participations are numerous. We do have an awful lot of registries, um, disease or specific. Um, we have the PROMIS system here in BC for renal. And we have the Panorama Public Health System. Um, some of these systems are meant to be clinician used. Some of them are meant to be more along the lines of repositories. We also have professional organizations looking uh, to uh, aid uh, professional development and improvement at, uh, at work credentialing. Um, and in large measure, the result of this fellow, <laughs> um, trying to work towards more effective ways at, at credentialing individuals to ensure that they're uh, uh, truly competent. Um, and the education, community level activities and, and population health aspirations. And I actually love the notion that population health is, uh, uh, we heard at lunch, is actually uh, just a grab bag for anything that, in an interest of selling something to be to be which be is nameless, and I'm hoping that maybe I can shed some light on what that might be. The landscape uh, right now, and this is actually admittedly a bit old, um, but clearly shows that the majority of healthcare activity right now is going on uh, outside of hospitals, and yet it's the hospital systems that we're spending all of our attention on at least in Canada. I know it's the opposite in, in the UK, um, but here we've, uh, we're have we spending an extraordinary amount of money for the area in the circle. But, but meanwhile, and this, this was actually a slide meant to show the communication pathways that are happening, um, but it also shows that all roads re lead to Rome, and Rome in this instance is the primary care. And we're moving more and more towards a primary care oriented, primary care home-based care. Americans are probably outstripping us in that, um, even though historically they've been more of a specialty focused kind of a system. So where do we want to go? Well, the first thing, um, this IBM article uh, spelt wrong, I noticed business transformation. Um, in 1993 is the alignment of business and information technology strategies. We've been by and large bogged down with trying to um, sort of implement IT and it's been quite separate from actually aligning that with, the, with our business. And so I love this tweet that came out a little while ago, 680 CIOs speak out business strategy is the new IT strategy. Well, go figure. <laughs> but it actually is true, embarrassingly. We also know that the whole landscape out there is much bigger than healthcare when it comes to health, the socioeconomic determinants of health, um, lifestyle, and all of that sort of stuff. We're primarily focused in here, but I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit in a bit about what we're doing, about trying to connect and expand our horizons with the data that is in primary care, even though primary care may not be directly trying to em encourage activity uh, at the community level, but it certainly is a great place to start measuring it the results of community efforts at increasing physical activity. The, the patient-centered primary care Bring It On Home document was a, a seminal document from the College of Family Physicians for the Canadian approach to primary care. Uh, the key words here being coordinated, continuous and comprehensive, uh, tomb to womb, cradle to grave, whatever you want, <laughs> however you want to call it, uh, and with access to an uh, interdisciplinary team. And um, this isn't meant to be an unabashed uh, advertisement for physicians. Uh, the public prefers the family physician to be the coordinator of the care, but that doesn't mean that they want the family physician to be the executor of all the care. And so the old top of license, which I think I, I heard uh, somebody say earlier this morning. So our view in Northern Health is a series of uh, um, primary care homes aided by specialists. Um, with uh, home and assisted living, home and community care uh, activities, hospitals, of course, pharmacists, and the whole uh, nine yards, um, but with a Northern Health community care um, team in the middle providing support and assistance and being part of the primary care home. It's, uh, this is a bit complicated slide, more to impress that we put how much work we put into this, <laughs> um, but it does speak to the notion that of reorienting uh, traditional northern health work into teams around primary care and we are really serious about this and going uh, hell-bent for leather to transform in the next one to two years uh, to that system. We definitely are starving for data-driven systems. We have a lot of electronic paper records, we have a lot of randomly assorted fielded structured information from which to um, to to get some translate information or data to information and 
information to wisdom. Um, but we definitely need more work there, we, and we also need more standards, even if the systems can support things like coded health conditions and social history and uh, uh, socioeconomic factors like living arrangements, occupation, and so on. We need standards so we can exchange and report and have a consistent way of, of looking at it. And the, the whole need for continuing professional development is you're going to use these things effectively, all of these systems effectively, you've got to know what it's all about, the big picture, so to speak. And a structure that has a limited number of systems. I know there's a lot of talk about one patient, one record, lots of people are working towards that. Along the journey to that, we're definitely not going to be able to have that. But secure messaging across systems is a way, uh, as long as that messaging can support structured data, uh, we can go a long ways to having, acting as if there is one system. And so for that end, um, Interior Health and Northern Health uh, partnered together for a clinical document architecture system, which we have now and which we have uh, built a system to support it. Uh, we've been doing some intensive work at looking at international standards for things like the care plan and uh, using these standards for the data transfer as well as what we know about healthcare to build a system for doing a, an idealized care plan, if you will. Um, which has all of the elements of preferences, goals, actions, and the whole things. And, and there is a background of HL7 RIM structure to be able to uh, deal with that and message it later. On the messaging front, we built a Rosetta Stone, we think, um, which will take a CDA message, pass it through the broker, send it to an EMR. Cool. Um, documents of all sorts with attachments, level three down the road as necessary. But... Similarly, the same system can actually go EMR to EMR and take that same structured message and pass it from one system to another. And that system could be a personal health record where a patient is going to message their PO2, their height, their weight, and so on to the doctor's, uh, the primary care system in the same way that, um, that the lab system is doing that. And then finally, to be able to message that back from the primary care home or the EMR, the specialist EMR, back to the health system for putting, say, a care plan up at a broad, more broadly available um, platform. Now, th this has come with a lot of challenges. It took us a lot longer to do that than we thought because we actually were at risk of breaking stuff that we had. And so we've had to build data quality tools to be able to fill in the metadata that our big systems can't provide. Otherwise, we run the risk of... Uh, uh, destroying the ability to do simple things like uh, mammography aud audits. Um, distributed databases is another um, platform that will be very useful. Um, it, we built this about five, six years ago called AMCARE, Aggregated Metrics for Clinical Analysis, Research and Evaluation, a real mouthful, but everything else was copyrighted. Um, and <laughs> what it really boils down to, sorry, is replicating the data from a primary care home to a standardized format and uh, I mean, so all lab tests, all imaging tests, all procedural reports and so on, not just selected subsets of those domains, doing that across multiple practices and then having an ability to call out from those uh, practices to say, have you got something for me? And the central system says, yes, I do. I have this query. Would you run it for me? And then the query may be something like this existing scorecard and it's uh, 52 different numerators and denominators, which are all aggregates like the QAF and then send it back to the central place for aggregation and safe display of protecting physician privacy, and then people can view aggregates. We built this and have it in live and working well in all of those places with the red stars and are moving towards having it uh, broadly available across our health authority, especially with the Physician Data Collaborative a group that we brought together to try to extend this to um, more vendors. And we can do things like look at the age structure in Prince George, Compare that with the age structure in the Northeast, which is clearly younger in the oil patch. Um, we can look at chronic disease, uh, or sorry, look at um, the denominators for many of the disease indicators actually form the prevalence indicators. And so we can see that the prevalence for diabetes is increasing because we're all getting older. Uh, however, in the Northeast, where the people are younger, it's not, increase, it's not as, uh, as big a problem. Um, on the provider side of things, uh, we've been working really hard at the four R's, readying people at the practice level 
uh, preparing them to do something, awareness and a desire to do something about improving quality of care, ensuring that they have appropriate reminders, clinical decision support or cockpits like a pilot does to cor make corrective action at the point of care, to reflect at the practice level at where the gaps of care are and then reinforce uh, through professional development, satisfaction, not money actually at the point, well actually we don't have any money, <laughs> so <laughs> that's why we had to get innovative. Um, and a lot of this is happening through um, practice coaching. And we have a very organized practice coaching uh, spreading across the north, uh, but especially with the Prince George Division of Family Practice, a very formalized approach with increasing engagement across um, many of the practitioners. Even the ones in the red actually are doing an awful lot of good work with uh, structured data, using their clinical decision support cockpits, which use their care plan goals as overrides to respect the variation. Uh, even remind them about billing, the finance piece. Everybody goes to the billing courses. <laughs> We're trying to get them to go to the clinical evidence courses with the same zeal. Um, <laughs> um, and be able to reflect on the practice to find named individuals, because now you're in your practice, that you can actually look at the gaps of care. Uh, you can look at your age structure. And in fact, this, uh, if that was me, I'd be worried about finding a replacement. Uh, I'm getting older, my patients are getting older, and the young guys are not going to want to look after this. <laughs> uh, this is actually real stuff, by the way. Um, and this is also real um, as an example of um, what coaching and, and intentional improvement is doing. There's colorectal screening in keeping with our provincial initiative. Pretty high base level in Prince George and the Green Triangles going back to 2005. Uh, but some people are really taking this on with gusto. Some people are really looking at measuring body uh, mass index, waist circumference and so on, as this one practice did. And in the measuring have made a diagnosis rate very equivalent to CIHI's estimate of uh, overweight and obesity in uh, Canada in adults. Um, I'm just going to fly through some of these things because uh, I'm one minute time. I just wanted, this is uh, no relation to this fellow here, um, but I just wanted to tell you a story if once a seed is set, and once you have the platform of quality improvement, the data, like you just saw from, the ag from aggregation, a coaching strategy, if you have a bunch of residents or giving their presentations on their practice improvement project, as happened here with aortic aneurysm screening, and, you, and we just happen to coincidentally have in the evidence-based review aortic aneurysm screening as a reminder, and we may have, when, when a resident presented this, um, it appears that people went back and started using their reports, started using their reminder systems, and started actually measuring, doing more uh, aneurysm screening. Now, nobody actually organized this as a project. Uh, it just happened, the resident presents, and uh, uh, so there's where the resident presented, and there's what happened to the community level and to one practice. Some resident luckily escaped my scrutiny and did a second aortic aneurysm screening presentation two years later. Another practice, the purple dots are individual practices, um, did the same thing, and thereby raising the whole screening rate of the community. And they actually raised it to where it should be, actually, 60%, which is the expected uh, in males smoking and so on. It's a bit of a long story. But the, the point of all of this is, is that in the rate with the fertile ground set, uh, these kinds of things happen, the accidental improvement, and what our vision is, is that this will happen across the board as everybody feels fit and capable and we'll be able to watch it and get the professional satisfaction on that reinforcement um, that's needed to make anything sustainable. 